John, let me turn to you. I've always said for years that, that we should be providing our pathologists with adequate tissue <coughs> samples, that yes. the, the heavy lifting, so to speak, from the pathologist's point of view is done on, by viewing the morphology. Right. And making that decisions. But but a lot of special stains are used. Could you comment on the use of IHC special stains? How many? Not too many? Th those sure, sorts of absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be happy to do that. I think uh, the testing landscape has really changed over the past 10 years. Uh, histological diagnosis is very important. Uh, tissue stewardship is something we're hearing a lot about now, making sure we have sufficient tissue for all the necessary biomarker testing. Now this is particularly an issue for uh, lung cancer because we have the most, the highest number of biomarkers we need to assay and usually the smallest biopsies, yeah. either the core needle biopsy or a fine needle aspirate. So tissue stewardship is very important. In cases where we are uh, really favoring a primary lung cancer, uh, an adenocarcinoma usually, we can really limit ourselves only using two markers. We will use TTF1 as a marker for adenocarcinoma and either P63 or P40 is a squamous cell carcinoma. And if there's no uh, evidence of differentiation and we're thinking primary lung, that's usually what we do before we will proceed to biomarker-based testing. So tissue stewardship is something really that, that you hear a lot about in pathology circles these days. And um, the whole uh, th purpose is really to prioritize tissue once you make a diagnosis and you have a firm diagnosis for kind of the multiple molecular tests. One of the most common questions that I get asked uh, by community uh, oncologists is how much do you need to do all of this testing? Right. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of variables there. So what's your answer to that question? You, if you choose uh, appropriate biomarker test, um, you really do not have to have a dramatic amount of tissue. We're used to in pathology working with small tissue samples in lung ca cases. And we'd like to try to reserve those with very high tumor content for the biomarker test because it's not really the quantity of tissue that's important, but it's the quantity of tumor that is right. important. Right. So making sure we get a good biopsy that has sufficient tumor content really is what drives the biomarker testing landscape. Yeah, and I think, I think it goes without saying, I think all of us who are in um, tertiary care centers understand the importance of the clinicians to communicate well with the pathologist to you know, give them a tentative diagnosis. I find a lot of these pathologists may be doing excessive IHC stainings because they don't know the clinical history. They might be concerned that this is a pancreatic primary or a colon primary, and they're doing these other stains to kind of rule these things out, but it uses up tissue in this particular area. Yeah, it absolutely does, and I think uh, particularly in the community setting, uh, communication is the key. We are all blessed to be at, at uh, institutions that have a lot of multidisciplinary tumor boards, and I think communicating between oncology, you're either your radiologist or pulmonologist who are doing your biopsy work, and pathology and the molecular group who's doing your testing is very important. So in this day and age of being able to Skype, WebEx, have teleconferences, really there's no excuse for not being able to have multidisciplinary tumor conferences even in the community setting. Right. So I want to get back to Greg and, and ask them, you know, once he goes to tier two, so to speak, um, how, how wide should you cast that net? Uh, is it, is it the foundation medicine approach where we get a lot of things we don't know what to do with? Should you be more focused? What are the various platforms out there? How should docs think about this? Yeah, so I think when you, when you look at that second tier, when you're, when you're going beyond the, the standard FDA approved test, um, you're looking for things that are gonna make patients eligible for trials, and you're looking for things that may help you use drugs with other indications that might be helpful for you. Now, of course, that's maybe, if you're being optimistic, another 10 or 12 genes. But as you suggest, there are platforms out there that can look for 400 gene mutations, 400 gene amplifications, rearrangements, and beyond. And you know, I think when we're sitting here thinking about doing a test, and we just heard the challenges of tissue acquisition, the challenges of tissue stewardship, it's incumbent upon us to be as efficient as possible when we do these tests. And so when we look at what's, what the next level includes, 
it's hard not to do 400 genes if it's the same amount of DNA as you'd require to look at 10 genes. As long as the cost is the same. As long as the cost is the same. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the next step really, and so I, th I think the broader the better in that regard. But one key next step is not to overinterpret right. those results. Right. You know, and I think that one of the challenges when you've done 400 gene mutation tests is you get back, you know, there are 16 mutations, 14 genes you've never heard of, and then two genes you've heard of but don't really have any relevance at all in the lung cancer world. Uh, you don't know what to do with that. And, and I have to say that I've seen some mutation testing platforms where they overinterpret those results. Right. And they, they, their, their routine recommendation is to use Everolimus. That seems to be a kind of <laughs> knee-jerk uh, reaction. Uh, and you should try Everolimus in this patient. Of course, we know that Everolimus has been tested in this patient yeah. population and has a response rate of 3% or less. It's not the right approach. Right. Uh, and so I think um, that's the caveat, really. Broader the better, but just the caveat, of don't overinterpret those results. Okay. And John, I wanted to get back to you, the other about uh, tissue stewardship. I will tell you that one of the issues that uh, takes up a lot of my nurses in our program administrator's time is getting tissue from outside institutions. Absolutely. Yeah. One place to the other. You would think you were you know, trying to rob Fort Knox half the time. So <laughs> what, what, what are the issues there? Um, any suggestions on how to make this easier for docs? Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, we are all very guarded with our tissue samples from our patients. Um, things have gotten much better in pathology, I would say, in the last five years about sharing slides and sharing blocks with outside institutions because we realize in the local setting, particularly in the community, we may not have access to the sophisticated levels of testing that are needed to characterize these patients. So, you know, work with the uh, lab who is doing your testing or who is doing your consultation and see if you are uncomfortable with sending a block to them, uh, what's the minimum number of unstained slides that they will accept for the testing if you don't want to um, let the block leave your institution and some institutional policies, policies do prevent yeah. blocks leaving, then perhaps you can send unstained slides or if you do have a molecular pathology lab, even isolated tumor DNA from, from previous biomarker testing should be acceptable.